Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Tiffany. I'm a software engineer from the East Bay. And today I want to talk to you about an open source project called Prefixy. And this is a project that I worked on this past fall, along with two other developer friends of mine. And we had a lot of fun working on this project together. So I just wanted to share with you all what it's about and how we built it. So what is Prefixy? Instead of telling you what it is, why don't I just show you? So I'm here on our prefixy.io landing page where we have a demo set up. So if you notice that as I type into the search field, suggestions would appear to me just like how you would expect an autocomplete to work. Um, but if you think about a Google-style autocomplete, <laughs> those suggestions are actually being dynamically updated all the time. So those suggestions are actually being crowdsourced based on what other users have been typing. And we wanted to implement that feature of autocomplete as well. And so as an example of that, if I type in a brand new search query into my search field, and I might have spelled that wrong. Um, and I press enter. Yeah, I spelled that wrong. So now when I uh, submitted that search query, um, Patty Mayonnaise is actually showing up as a suggestion. But notice if I just type P, then Patty Mayonnaise isn't showing up yet. And that's because I only submitted it that one time. But as more and more users submit a search query for Patty Mayonnaise, then its score will climb higher and higher until eventually its score will be high enough that it will show up if I just type P. So Prefixy is a hosted backend service with the idea being that we want to abstract away and make it trivially easy for any app developer to get such an autocomplete for their own application. So for this talk, I don't just want to talk about Prefixy itself. I really want to talk about the lessons that my team learned and the trade-offs that we made as we built the system from scratch. So hopefully, some of the lessons that we learned, you can take with you and apply to your own projects. So I just want to go over a few important terms before moving on. Uh, a prefix we're defining as what the user has entered into the search field so far. Completions are going to be all possible ways that a prefix may be completed, and this is what we're going to store on our back end. Each completion comes with a corresponding score, which is an integer that represents that completion's relative popularity. Suggestions are the top ranked completions, and this is what we're ultimately going to display back to the user. And then lastly, we have this concept of a selection, which is what the user actually selects, selects in the drop down list. Alternatively, a selection can be a brand new search query that the user types into the search field and enters. So during the demo, when I typed patty mayonnaise, that would count as a brand new selection. So in the beginning, we wanted to clarify our design requirements up front. And there were two main requirements that we had to meet. First, reads must be extremely fast. So if suggestions return too slowly, then autocomplete is no longer useful as a service. And secondly, suggestions need to be dynamically ranked and relevant to the app user. So we should only return the top five or 10 suggestions. And those suggestions should be the most popular and also lexicographically relevant based on the search query so far. And these requirements implied a few things. Uh, we want to prioritize speed of reads. So as we build the system, we always need to keep speed of reads at the top of our minds. And we're also going to need some sort of ranking algorithm to keep track of the scores of our completions. So now that we've clarified our design requirements, let's dive into data structures and algorithms. 
And in the beginning, our data looks something like this. We have some completions with scores, and the question is, how should we store these? And we found that tries are a natural fit for prefix search. Tries are a tree-based data structure where each node represents a single character. And tries provide O of L lookup of a prefix, where L is the length of the prefix that we're looking up. For instance, if I wanted to look up the prefix CA, then I would start from my root and then traverse to C and then traverse to A, and then I would be at my CA prefix node. And that took a total of two steps, one step for each character in the prefix. Tries are also space efficient since common prefixes can be shared. So notice in my try, I'm storing both of the words cart and cat, and both of these words are sharing the same C and A nodes. And so I don't need to duplicate C and A for each of those words. So that's nice in terms of space savings. So that's a try in general, but how would we use a try for our own use case? So if the user has typed in C A into the search field, how would we return suggestions back to them with a try? So the first thing we need to do is actually find the prefix in our try. And as as I just went over, that's an O of L operation, where L is the length of the prefix. Then after we get to the prefix, we need to find its completions. And to do that in a try, we actually need to visit each and every single node beneath our CA prefix node. And in the worst case scenario, that's an O of N operation, where N is the total number of nodes that we're storing in our try. And after we find our completions, we still need to sort them in order to return the top five or 10. And assuming that we're using quick sort, that's an O of K log K operation, where K is the number of completions that we found for that prefix. So the total time complexity to search for completions in a try would be O of L plus O of N plus O of K log K. And that's not very efficient. We thought that we could do better than that and it turns out that we can. And we can improve the time complexity if we actually store prefixes completions together with that prefix in the same node. And that looks like this. So notice now my CA prefix node, I'm now storing all of its completions as well. And what this gives us is it effectively eliminates the need for step two of our previous solution, since now, once I get to my prefix, my completions are already there for me. And the trade-off we're making here is that this optimization requires um, consuming more space, because I'm gonna be storing a lot of duplicate completions for different prefixes. Notice that car and cart are actually appearing in my try multiple times. And this optimization is also going to require more writes because I need to keep all these completions updated. But remember that we said we want to prioritize the speed of reads, so we're more than willing to consume more space and have more writes if we can gain that increase in performance of the speed of reads. So with this optimization, our time complexity now improves to be just O of L plus O of K log K. And there were two further optimizations that we found. Uh, first, we could hold L constant, where L is the length of, pre the max length of prefixes that we're storing on our back end. For instance, consider a long tail completion such as Tyrannosaurus rex lived during the late Cretaceous period. So that's a pretty long completion, right? And most of the time, search queries are going to be shorter than that. So for instance, most of the time when I'm Googling something, I'm just gonna be searching for like video cameras or something. And if you consider slicing up that long completion into all of its possible prefixes, that's a whole lot of prefixes and there's diminishing returns to storing all of those prefixes. So we can reasonably set a max limit on the length of prefixes that we're storing. And we're still gonna be able to store these long completions such as Tyrannosaurus rex lived during the late Cretaceous period, but we're just going to store them underneath that max length prefix that we have on our backend. 
And then the other thing we could do is we could actually hold k constant as well, where k is the number of completions we're storing for any given prefix. And the reason we can do this is because we only need to store enough completions to support returning the top five or 10 suggestions. But we do need to store more than five or 10 completions though because we need to have enough of a buffer to enable accurate popularity ranking. And I'm gonna be going into our ranking algorithm later, but for now just know that we found that storing around 50 completions for any given prefix was enough for our use case. So now that we're holding both L and K constant, our time complexity is now effectively O of one plus O of one, which is basically O of one. And at this point, we're quite happy with our solution. We got down to O of one reads, and that ensures that our service is going to stay fast even as we store more and more data. But we did find one final optimization we can do, and that is instead of storing our data in a conventional try, we can store it in a prefix hash tree, um, which is a, what we're calling this hybrid data structure. Um, it's basically a hash, but it still retains a try-like access pattern. And it looks like this. So now we're gonna map our prefixes to hash keys, and then we're going to map the prefixes completions to the hash value. And what this gives us is we no longer even need to traverse to get to that prefix. We could just get to our prefix in one single step since that prefix is now just a hash key. Also, the prefix hash tree really lends itself well to being stored in a NoSQL data store. And I'll be getting into why that's beneficial soon. Uh, the trade-off that we're making here again is that we do need to consume more space again because if I store my data in a hash now, then I actually lose the tries ability to share common prefixes. And also a hash just inherently consumes more space since we need to account for its load factor. Um, but again, remember that our top priority is the speed of reads, so we were more than willing to make that trade off. And ultimately we did decide to go with the prefix hash tree as our primary data structure to store our prefixes. So with that decided, the next question we turned to was how do we actually implement this in a data store? And as, as I just mentioned, the prefix hash tree really lends itself well to being stored in a NoSQL data store. And in our case, we chose to go with Redis for two main reasons. Redis is an entirely in-memory data store, and that's great for us because we need speed of reads and querying from memory is a lot faster than querying from hard disk persistence. Also, Redis provides a number of native in-memory data structures. So what we could do is we will map our prefixes to Redis keys, and then we could choose one of these data structures that Redis provides to us um, to actually store our completions as the Redis value. And if we do this right, then this could make working with completions easier as well as more efficient. So now the question was which Redis data structure should we actually use to store our completions? And up until now, it looks as if we've been storing our completions in an array, but we actually haven't decided how to store those just yet. And we considered two different options. The first was the Redis list. And in Redis, a list is a doubly linked list, which means you can access the head and tail nodes in O of one time. And accessing any other nodes takes O of k time, where k is the number of nodes in my list. So that's just a brief overview of the list in general, but how uh, we wanted to analyze the list in light of two main functions of our system. The first main function of our system is, of course, search. So how that works with the list is we'd simply issue an lrange command to get the first five nodes of the list. And since we're accessing the head of the list, that's just an O of one operation. The other main function of our system is increment. So whenever a user makes a selection, we invoke increment in order to bump up the score of that selected completion. 
And this actually turns out to be quite complicated with the Redis list, and that's because we need to figure out how to sort by score in our own application. So how that would work is first we would do an lrange command to pull the entire list back into our application. That's an O of K operation. And once we have that list in our application, we need to perform a binary search in order to find the completion that we want to increment and look at what its score currently is. And then next, we need to do another binary search um, to figure out where the completion should go if its score is incremented by one. So both of those binary searches are O of log K operations. And now after we've figured all of this out in our own application, now we actually have to go and issue these updates in Redis. And we can do that by first issuing an lrem command, which is going to remove that completion from its current position in the list. And then finally, we can do an l insert command, which is going to insert that same completion back into the list, but in its new position now that its score has been incremented by us. So in summary, the Redis list provides O of 1 search, which is really good. Um, however, there are several cons associated with incrementing. Um, the algorithm actually requires three round trips to Redis, and with that many requests, we may run into concurrency issues, potentially. The algorithm also requires us to carry a large payload, because we're having to pull the entire list back into our own application. And we also need to take care of maintaining uniqueness and sorting by score in our own application, uh, which isn't as fast as uh, doing that on the data store level, since that could be done on a lower level if it's being done on the data store. So with all these cons, we wanted to see if the Redis sorted set can do any better. And that's the other Redis data structure that we considered. In Redis, a sorted set is a collection of items where each item has a value and corresponding score. The sorted set comes with a uniqueness guarantee and also it keeps its own items sorted by score. In Redis, sorted sets are implemented under the hood with the skip list data structure, which makes almost all operations O of log K, so that's really nice. So, so far, this data structure looks like a really good fit for our needs. Um, so let's just see how search would work. So with the sorted set, we'd issue a zrange command to get the first five items in the sorted set, and that is an O of log K operation. And how would increment work? So actually, all we need to do to increment with a sorted set is issue a z increment by command to increment that selected completion. And the reason why we could just do this in one single step is because Redis is handling maintaining uniqueness and keeping items sorted by score for us. So that's really nice. So to sum that up, Search with the sorted set is technically O of log K, which isn't as fast as the O of one that we were getting with the list. But remember that K for us is a constant, so for us, search is effectively O of one anyway. And then on the other hand, we get all these benefits associated with the incrementing logic, which includes fewer round trips to Redis, which also means less chance of concurrency issues, smaller payloads because we're, we're not having to pull anything back into our own application. And also, Redis is taking care of maintaining uniqueness and keeping items sorted, which is faster than if we had to do it. So for all these reasons, we did decide to go with the sorted set to store our completions. Um, in the end, it was pretty obvious that this was the better data structure for our own unique needs. And as you just saw, the incrementing logic with the sorted set is just a one-step operation. Um, but remember that we did decide that we want to put a limit on K, and so we still need some sort of application logic to handle maintaining our K limit. And to do this, we actually borrowed a solution that was recommended by the creator of Redis in one of his blog posts. 
And how that works is imagine that the user submits a search for JavaScript. And on our back end, JavaScript is a brand new completion in the sorted set. So we're going to want to insert that into our sorted set. However, we're already at our k limit. So what do we do in this case? Our solution is to remove the lowest rank completion, in this case, JS hint, and remember its score. And then we're going to insert JavaScript with JS hints score plus one. And the reason why we do this instead of inserting JavaScript with a score of one or even 10 is because if we insert a JavaScript with a score of one, then JavaScript will be the lowest ranked completion. And the next time a brand new completion comes in, JavaScript is going to be immediately kicked out. And we don't want that because we want to give all completions a fair shot at rising to the top suggestions. So that's our algorithm to handle that. And at this point, we have our app implemented with Redis, but there's a slight problem, which is that if we want to offer Prefixy as a service for any app developer to utilize, then keeping all our data in memory may quickly become too expensive. So we need to find another alternative. And as we thought about this, we realized that not all prefixes actually need to be kept in memory all the time. So why don't we just keep the most recently used prefixes in memory? And we can do that by setting an LRU eviction policy in Redis. So now Redis is only going to hold the most recently used prefixes. And once max memory is reached in Redis, then Redis will evict the least recently used prefixes. And what happens to those evicted prefixes? We're going to store them in hard disk persistence. And in our case, we chose to go with MongoDB, um, mainly because it is a key document data store and that mapped na nicely to the key value abstraction that we were already utilizing with Redis. So now with this new caching workflow in place, whenever a search query comes to Prefixy, we're always going to check Redis first. And in most cases, we'll find what we're looking for because most users are going to be querying for the most recently used data anyway. But in the event that we do have a cache miss, then that's when we go to Mongo. And in Mongo, what we're going to do is try to find that prefix. And if, if we find it, we're going to reinstate that prefix back into memory in Redis. Um, since that prefix has just been queried for. And the benefit of this is that now, if somebody asks us for that same data immediately afterwards, we'll be able to go and fetch it for them directly from memory since that data has just been reinstated. So this is a diagram of our system architecture so far. We have our prefixy app server, which handles talking to both Redis and MongoDB. And this also comes with a command line interface, which we use mainly for admin tasks, such as mass imports of data or testing. And we also wrote some client-side scripts that communicates with our Prefixy app server. And so at this point, we're really close to being able to offer this as a service, but just the last step that we need to complete is to implement multi-tenancy. And to do that, we came up with this token generation plus authentication workflow. And how that works is imagine that Jane is an app developer and she wants to utilize our service, so she's going to query our token generator server. And this is a brand new server that we're adding to our system architecture. The token generator server is going to generate a unique tenant ID, and it's going to encrypt that into a JSON web token. And then we're going to embed that into a script. We're then going to instruct Jane to include this custom script in the front end code of her web application, which she'll then do and then she'll be all set up. So now, whenever any users of Jane's site uh, type into the search field, our custom script is going to send HTTP get requests to our Prefixy app server, and all these requests are going to include Jane's 
unique JSON web token. And then once we receive that request, we can decrypt the JSON web token to get the app developer's unique tenant ID. And so again, now whenever search query comes to prefixy, those requests are going to all include the app developer's JSON web token, which we can then decrypt to get the app developer's unique tenant ID. And then we're going to use this tenant ID to get the app developer's site-specific data in both Redis and Mongo. And how does that actually work on the back end? In Redis, we prepend every prefix with a tenant ID. And then on the Mongo side, Mongo provides a built-in feature for namespacing called collections. So we simply allocate a Mongo collection to each app developer. And so in this way, an app developer's data will be namespaced in both Redis and Mongo. So this is our final system architecture. It's the same as before, but now that we've implemented multi-tenancy, we add, we've added this token generator server, which is in charge of generating JSON web tokens and also giving the app developer their custom script. And the reason why Prefixy can decrypt the tokens generated by the token generator server is because both of those servers share a common secret. So we actually haven't looked at any code yet, so I just want to briefly go over some of our front-end client code first. So as the user types into the search field, we're listening for that event. And each time that event fires, we're going to invoke fetch suggestions, which is responsible for issuing HTTP GET requests to our Prefixy app server. And then once those suggestions come back, we're going to iterate over the suggestions in the return JSON. And for each suggestion, we're going to append a list item to the drop-down list that's ultimately displayed back to the user. And then on our back end, this is our search function. It may look like a lot, but we've actually gone through all the logic for this already. So the first thing we do is we take the prefix query and we normalize it. So this is where we take care of white spacing and casing inconsistencies. Then we're going to prepend the tenant ID to each prefix. And remember that this is for namespacing purposes in Redis. Next, we're going to query Redis for the suggestions. And in most cases, we're going to find what we're looking for in Redis. But in the event that we do have a cache miss, then remember that's when we go to Mongo. And what Mongo load does is, again, that it checks if the prefix is in Mongo. And if it finds that prefix, then it's going to reinstate it back into memory. And after all of that finishes, we simply query Redis again. And now Redis should have what we're looking for since Redis has just been updated from Mongo. And then finally, we just return results back to the user. On the other hand, this is our increment function. So the first thing we do is extract prefixes. So what we're doing here is we're taking the selected completion and slicing it up into all of its possible prefixes up until that max length of prefix that we set. And then we're going to initiate this commands array where, where we'll collect all the commands needed to update Redis. Um, because in the end, we could uh, send all of these commands in one single batch request, which minimizes network requests. And then so for each extracted prefix, we're going to perform the following logic. We check for two conditions. Was the selected completion a brand new completion in the sorted set? And if so, are we at our K limit? If both of those conditions are true, then we need to perform that replacement logic that we went over earlier. And just to go over that again, we're going to remove the lowest rank completion and remember its score, and then insert the brand new completion with the removed completion score plus one. But in most cases, users are going to be selecting completions that are already on our server. And so 
In those cases, we can perform the much simpler one-step algorithm to increment our completion. And if you recall, that simply involves issuing a Z increment by command to Redis. So in the end, this is when we actually send all of our commands in one single batch to Redis. And then after that finishes, then we issue the exact same updates to MongoDB. So we're definitely not done with prefixy yet. Here's some of our future plans. So first, we want to enable custom configurability of L and K. So as of now, these values are simply being hard-coded into our service. But the plan is to give the app developer the option of setting their own custom values for L and K. We also want to do extensive benchmarking to determine the ideal ratio of Redis to hard disk persistence that would minimize our cache misses. And this would ensure that we keep our cache misses low even as our service grows. There's a thing called Lua scripting for Redis. And what this would allow us to do is it would allow us to push a lot of our application logic to Redis. So that Redis will be able to act as a true write-through cache, which means that prefixy um, doesn't need to be the intermediary between those two um, like it is right now. And then lastly, we want to implement API rate limiting um, just as a guard against any malicious actors who may be trying to overload our servers with too many requests. And yeah, that's all I had for this talk today. Thank you all for listening. Um, Prefixy is an open source project, so if you want to contribute or if you just want to fork it, you can go to our Prefixy project repo on GitHub. And if you want to use Prefixy for your own project, you can check out our prefixy.io landing page where you can generate your own JSON web token and get your custom script. If you have any questions about Prefixy, feel free to email me directly. And by the way, I'm also on the job hunt. I'm actually new to the Bay Area, so if you have any leads on that, I'd be happy to talk to you as well. So are there any questions? <laughs> no, no, don't talk to them, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, is there a reason that you use uh, MongoDB instead of some kind of classic search? Nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> 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 but it seems like, like Elasticsearch might have some, just some... It's hard to hear back here because you're reading it. Thanks for that. Yeah, we did look into Elasticsearch. Um, I think our motivation was just um, to do one thing really well, which is prefix search. And I think Elasticsearch is more of like a catch-all, um, if I'm not wrong about that, um, more for like full text search as well as prefix search. Yeah. Well, I think what you might have been suggesting is using this in this or rather using this in prefix search. Because it's indexing. Oh, okay. Yeah, we actually hadn't uh, thought of doing that. Um, yeah, we mostly went with Mongo because, um, yeah, it's a key document uh, structure mapped well to what we were already using with Redis. And then um, some of us had already used MongoDB, so that's why we went with that. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting idea and that I'll look into more. Yeah. Um, was there a reason that you didn't aggregate the uh, increments or make those async somehow? Because I think you get a good performance if you're not doing the increments in real time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we did think of like offloading it and having like a queue kind of uh, setup with the increments, um, but at this point. Well, we chose to use Node specifically for its non-blocking features. Um, so when the increments are happening, we'll, we're still able to uh, fulfill requests. Um, but yeah, that is something that we uh, want to think about doing in the future. Uh, 
I have a question. And if you think about what will happen with how it locks for concurrency, like how it would degrade under load. Uh, what would happen without, for lock? without locks on Redis? Uh, I mean, by is what time, right? Is it? I didn't know. I, I think just the, the, the simple question here is, is, is Z incrementing, is that locking on the value that's stored or not? I think that's the... Um, I actually haven't looked into locks just for Z increment by, um, but because it was just one single network request to Redis, I guess we just assume, but yeah, we should make sure what's actually going on with the locks, yeah. Okay, two more. <laughs> yeah, so... so okay. Yeah, it's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. <laughs> so can Jane set uh, an initial like, default set of completions? Oh, yeah. Um, that was a decision we made as we were building this project, um, what we kind of wanted it to be, and there are already open source implementations out there that would be more for like a fixed data set. Um, and so we just kind of like the idea that you could just plug and play, kind of autocomplete, and build up your suggestions based on that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that is something that we thought about. And yeah, I think it would be a cool feature to add. I like it. I'll do now. <laughs> because you're mostly storing pretty tiny strings, how many completions are you storing, say, per gig in Redis? Do you have a ballpark? Um, no, we actually haven't like done that level of extensive testing yet. Uh, most of our testing so far has been like manual testing with Insomnia, which is an HTTP client. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't have those exact numbers as of now. Yeah. Last one. Um, I noticed on the client side, you said that you're doing just get requests. Have you thought about doing some of the website to minimize the, you know, the load on the servers for each, each chain of characters? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that. Have you considered using like WebSockets or some kind of open connection on the client to reduce the number of web requests for every time a person touches a character and there's even other web requests? There's a lot of overhead and all that stuff. Yeah, we did look into like long polling or like WebSockets um, just as an alternative to uh, straightforward HTTP requests. Um, I think we just really wanted to get a minimum viable product out there as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I think that's a idea that we definitely want to look into for the future. That sounds like